Hopefully you've been following along in our daily Bible readings. Uh, I know many of you in our group have uh, far exceeded what we do, but a lot of us are joining together to read through the New Testament at the beginning of this year. And if you did so, then um, hopefully you came to today's passage, uh, Mark chapter 9. Now there's a story there that um, I guess I've always thought was an amazing story, but it never really sunk in how powerful this story was until I was a parent. And of course, in Mark 9, starting in verse 14, we find the story of this man who has a, a young boy who is demon-possessed. And you can just tell what kind of agony is, he is in. He would do anything to uh, get healing for his son, to get safety for his son. Now, I just want to read those verses before we get any further. Uh, if you would like to follow along in your Bible, I'll be reading in the New American Standard Version, Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 14. When they came back to the disciples, that was Jesus and three of his apostles who were up on the Mount of Transfiguration. When they came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. Immediately, when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he asked them, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought you my son, possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams to the ground, and he foams at the mouth, he grinds his teeth, he stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not do it. And he answered them and said, O unbelieving generation, how long shall I put up with you? Uh, or how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. They brought the boy to him. When he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into convulsion. Falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It's often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Now immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe, help my unbelief. And that's the phrase we're going to focus on today. I'm going to finish the story, but I do believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him, and do not enter him again. After crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, he came out, and the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him, and he got up. When he came again to the house, his disciples began questioning him privately. Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. So uh, what an amazing miracle of Jesus, but uh, an amazing display from the Father, as well as a glimpse at the weakness of the faith of the apostles. Now, uh, apparently, for some time, uh, the apostles had tried to cast out this demon, and they had cast out demons before, and Jesus had seen him have great success in that. Uh, they knew they had miraculous gifts, and yet here is uh, a case they just couldn't solve, uh, a problem they just couldn't fix. Now, uh, Jesus points out pretty clearly what the problem was. It was the smallness of their faith. And he criticizes the entire generation, as well as, specifically, his apostles. Uh, this is actually a, a pretty important story. It, it appears in the, all three of the first Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, and they each have a little bit different spin on it, but say exactly you know, the same thing here. Uh, we understand that what it takes is faith. And that's why they were unable. They were surprised. They've been casting out demons, no problem. But they were trusting in themselves. They were not trusting wholly in God. They saw the extreme nature of this case. They saw how long it had been happening. And their faith did not allow them to accomplish a great thing. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we read in our uh, daily Bible reading the version of this that is in Mark. And it involved uh, one little illustration that is different than the one that is in Mark's account here. In Matthew, 
Um, I might have misspoken there. I'm trying to remember what I just said. Matthew's account includes a detail that Mark's does not. And if you've been reading the bulletin articles, um, then you know I have written about this, and it is about the mustard seed. And I want you to try to see it right here. If you're looking on the video, uh, you probably can't. I'll put it up close to the camera. That's a mustard seed. Um, I mentioned in that article that I actually keep a container of mustard seeds on my desk. Um, and there's a reason for this. Um, it's funny, actually, the, the label mentions that it is not only talks about its flavor, but it's referred to as a symbol of faith in the New Testament. Uh, I guess McCormick uh, decided to put that on their, uh, their labeling and talk about it there. But those seeds are small. Uh, I doubt I could easily pick it up now that I just put it down on the pulpit. Um, and, and I have to look at that intently, at that jar, when I feel small. Uh, I don't know what you think about me or what you think about how I view myself, but there are often times that I feel like I have a faith about that small. I have a faith that isn't much. Um, you know, it's easy to put on a show for everybody else, uh, to not talk about your own struggles or weaknesses or, we, you know, things that you know you've got to work on. And maybe I just feel like, wow, who am I to be preaching God's word? Who am I to be a Christian? Who am I to be a father to my children? Who am I to be a husband to my wife? Who am I as a Christian? Because I feel like a nobody. I feel small. Uh, maybe a task seems insurmountable. I don't know how to solve this problem. I don't know how to teach this difficult subject. I don't know how to um, come back from the mistakes that I've made. Now, fortunately, we, we have a group here that is encouraging, and people find the kindest ways to um, share with me ways that I can improve and, and talk to those things about me, and, and people are ready to listen if I go to them. But... Oftentimes, I just find myself sitting there and, and considering the greatness of the task, and I just don't feel enough. Now, maybe you consider your tasks, you consider um, paying off a debt or uh, dealing with a broken marriage or raising a troubling, troubled child, and you consider your task, what your lot in life is, and you feel like you just don't have enough. You're not enough. Um, you feel like you're in survival mode, floating to swim above you know, water, keep your head above water. I want to talk a little bit about that because faith is so important and it doesn't take much to get started, but faith grows. And what matters most is that we have that trust. I want to talk about a story where another one of the apostles who wouldn't be rebuked in this passage, but it's Peter. You know, Peter was not included in this group. He was one of the ones that was up on the mountain. But Peter also had a similar moment where his faith was small. But Jesus recognized he had a faith, and he prayed that it would not fail. Um, and I, I like to think that that kind of a, a prayer is something that is being offered on our behalf, that Jesus talks to his Father in heaven on our behalf the same way he talked about Peter. Uh, the passage I'm referencing, if you'd like to turn there, is in Luke 22. In Luke 22, and starting in verse 31, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, that when once you have been turned again, you may strengthen your brothers. Now, this is in regards to um, what's getting ready to happen to Jesus. He's going to be uh, forsaken. He's going to be uh, abandoned by everybody, just about, who loves him and is close to him. His apostles are going to flee, and he's going to be in shame, and people aren't really going to have an interest in Jesus anymore. Now he's going to go to the cross. And he knows that Peter, in particular, is going to deny him three times before the morning comes, before the morning light. And so this is a difficult situation here. Now, Peter... Um, he can't even fathom the fact that he would deny his Savior. He can't even fathom the fact that he would have a mistake. He doesn't realize how small his faith is. That's overconfidence. Um, can I 
suggest that if you feel often, you know, that sense of, wow, I, I couldn't mess up. You know, look at those people over there. They, they do that thing wrong. I could never do that. If that's an off, or a common pattern of thinking, if you think that way often, let me suggest that you need to uh, make a real honest look inside your heart and mind. Now, I'm not telling you to tear your own faith down. Confidence is a good thing in, in a proper amount. But I feel like sometimes we're like Peter, that we can't even imagine that we would walk away from our faith uh, by the way, I've known a lot of people to walk away from their faith. Friends that I grew up with, friends that I went to college with, uh, family members who at one point, um, one family member was even training to be a preacher and, and did great works and stuff in a church, and, and there's no way. And I can't imagine that person uh, in any of those groups that I've talked about just now, uh, I can't imagine any of them said, yeah, I definitely could end up being part of the world someday. I definitely could end up falling away from my faith someday. I can't imagine it entered any of their minds. Uh, but there's this overconfidence. Paul warns the Corinthians, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. We understand that the overconfidence there that, you know, he says at, at this point, um, Lord, uh, with you I'm ready to go both to prison and to death. Oh, really, Peter? Uh, just a few minutes from then, He's going to be denying that he's even known who Jesus is using, uh, you know, swearing to do so. But look what Jesus said again. Well, first of all, he says he's demanded, Satan's demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Uh, that'd be a little scary, right? To know my Savior just told me Satan just got the okay to bring the pain. Uh, actually, I'm, I feel like I'm kind of glad that I don't know every time. Man, that'd be scary. That'd be frightening. You know, now, I, there's times that I've come through on the other side, and I realize, wow, Satan must have asked for permission to, uh, to put me through the ringer, to sift me. And the act of sifting, you throw up the wheat and the, the outer part of the wheat together, and the, the grain that you want to save that's going to turn into flour, it falls down because it's heavier, and the chaff is this lightweight stuff, and it blows away. Satan was taking a bet that Peter's faith was something that was going to blow away whenever he was tossed up in the air in an unexpected way. Uh, Jesus was confident that Peter, the good stuff, would come down, that the good stuff would remain. It would stay there firm. Notice what he says again in that verse. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Now, I've got to admit, as I have studied this betrayal of Peter before, I've always assumed his faith failed. Um, you know, I've always assumed it was just an utter failure. And I don't think Jesus is saying that, you know, he isn't going to fail at all. But faith is something more than just like an I believe right here and then, you know, I, I make this confession that I believe. That he's not going to fall away from the faith, the truths that he knows to be true, the gospel truths about Jesus Christ, and the things he knows to be true about everything he's been taught and shown. Sure, he's going to be shaken. Sure, he's going to make mistakes. Sure, he's going to sin. And he's going to regret it deeply. But it's going to hurt him because he does still believe. Because he does still believe that Jesus is the Christ. And that's why... It's going to hurt him so bad when he realizes what he's just done. But that's also why he comes back. He, he continues, I prayed that your faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned again, will strengthen your brothers. So, in one moment, his faith may fail, but his faith altogether, his trust in the plan, his trust in God, his trust in the Savior, wasn't going to fail. And he had a purpose in this. So when we have this mustard seed faith, let's see if I can pick up the mustard seed again, that much faith, what do we do? Um, truth is, sometimes your faith may fail. You may have an opportunity at work to take a stand for the Lord, and you don't do it. 
You may have an opportunity to parent in a certain way that God would approve of, and you mess it up, and you lose your temper, or uh, you stoop to the level of your children. Uh, you may have a moment where you can show love, and you don't, where you can help somebody, and you neglect to. And, and those moments when I know I have failed, they, they rip me apart. You know, I have a, a conscience that wants to beat me up so bad that I feel like I can never get back up again. But that's not what God wants from us, is it? God knows we're human. God knows that from time to time we may make mistakes. But that if we truly trust in him, we truly trust in the plan, we will come back and make it right. We'll come back and do better next time. We'll come back and tell other people, do better than I did. I think we need to change the way we talk about failure. Failure is not the thing that, you know, makes you unworthy to ever be in anybody's presence here again. I think there is a stigma attached to it. And maybe it comes from the, the traditions of walking forward and then sitting on the front and admitting to your, your wrong. And then everyone, you know knowing what you did, and you admit it. I recall a few years ago a conversation with somebody who said they just didn't feel like they could come back in here with everybody knowing them and knowing what they had done and the choices they had made. They just didn't feel worthy to be in everyone's presence because they'd messed up so bad. Let me tell you, that's the kind of people we need here to stay. We need to make these people know there is great value. In the book of 1 Corinthians, we find a man who is living in great sin, and he has sin that is so great, it's even something the Gentile world would have bristled at. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, this man has relations with his own stepmother and is bragging about it. Uh, but Paul says what they're to do is to withdraw their social fellowship from him. And here's how he describes it. I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So there is a, a point in which someone fails, someone makes a mistake of a public nature like this, and they are unrepentant. And we might have to step back. We might have to change our relationship with them. But what is the goal? And why the harsh treatment? What does he say here? The goal is that he may be saved someday. That he may see what he was missing in the family of God. And he wants that back. He wants that fellowship with God. He wants that knowledge that if he were to die, he would go to heaven. He'd be with God. That eternity. The good news is we know what happened to this guy. I'm pretty convinced that in 2 Corinthians, this is the man who comes back. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, it says in verse 5, But if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree in order not to say too much to all of you. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, so that on the contrary... You should rather forgive and comfort him, otherwise such a one might be overwhelmed with excessive sorrow. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. So, just like God forgave us, we are to forgive others when they come back. And notice what he says, if you continue to treat that person with a stigma, even though they come back, even though they admit they've done wrong, even though they say they are super sorry and they want to work and they want to get better... They may be burdened with sorrow to a point that they never come back. And that's not the goal of difficult decisions to withdraw fellowship or anything like that. In fact, I believe that people who make mistakes end up being the most qualified to teach the gospel. Those that have come from uh, strange pasts where they have, have done things that are totally foreign to what God's plan is they might have a way to reach some people in the world that somebody else who doesn't have that same past might not be able to reach. 
And, for example, if someone suffers from addiction and they come back from that and they get their lives right with God, that person is now uniquely qualified to encourage somebody else who suffers from the same problem of addiction to say, I've been there, I've been where you were, and I felt like there was uh, no way out, and here's what I went through, but trust me, there is a way out. Uh, Someone who's gone through a broken marriage can... Find somebody else who's struggling in their marriage, or maybe they come from a broken marriage, and they, they share that, that pain with them and the sorrow, but they say there is a path through on the other side. Uh, the truth goes for any sort of sorrow, but I just want to specifically focus on that idea that the sorrow that comes from knowing I made a mistake, I did wrong, I blew it, I missed my chance. I've missed a lot of chances to do the right thing, to say the right thing, to to be the right person, um, to even just be there, be present, to speak up. And there's a part of me that Satan tempts and says, you just keep beating yourself up. You're no good in the kingdom because you make mistakes. You are a failure. I am reminded of my Uh, history class as we talked about Thomas Edison and how many tries it took him to find a filament for an incandescent light bulb. Uh, I've been to his workshop that's been moved actually to um, the Henry Ford Museum and the Greenfield Village that's up in Detroit area of Michigan. And walking in there and seeing all of the failures that went through to get to his invention to finally have a success. Spiritually speaking, uh, I don't want any of you to mess up. I don't want any of you to make mistakes or fail. But when you do, I want you to make it right and come back and find a way to grow from that failure so that you can now be useful and help somebody else. My prayer for myself and for you is the same that Jesus had for Peter. That even though you may be sifted, even though you may fall, that you will return again and you will strengthen your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's funny, that word strengthen that Jesus talks about there is not used very much in the New Testament. Um, One other place that Greek word is used comes in the book of 2 Peter. And so, um, you know, Peter was you know, prayed for by Jesus. Jesus prayed that when he returned from his mistake and his faith, that he would be able to strengthen other people. And notice what he says about why he wrote Second Peter. This is in Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth, which is present with you. That word established in my Bible is the same Greek word as the strengthened word back in Luke 22 and verse 32. So here, in this final letter Peter ever wrote that we know of, Peter is literally doing what Jesus prayed for him to do. That you, once you have returned, will strengthen others. He says, I have no trouble writing to you the same things that I've always taught you so that I can firmly strengthen you and you won't fail. Peter is basically saying, I failed in the past, and now I have succeeded. I want you to succeed now. You start out with a faith like the mustard seed, and you can do amazing things. What that man says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Uh, imagine the emotions of that man. He definitely believed in Jesus. Otherwise, he wouldn't have sought out his apostles. He wouldn't have sought out Christ himself. He had a faith. He had a trust in God. But he had lived so long with the burden of seeing his son in misery and danger that it was just almost too much to believe that it was possible that he could be normal again or maybe even normal for the first time. He does say from childhood that he'd had that condition. 
he might not even have very much memory at all of his son as a healthy young boy. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. What you need is a mustard seed of faith. And God can work with that. God will build your faith. He will help you to do that. He will help you to strengthen that faith so you can strengthen others in time. I want to end by just going up a couple of verses here in 2 Peter, if you're still here. In 2 Peter, there is this list of godly traits that they build upon each other. Uh, Notice that we can become partakers of divinity, really. Not that we are gods, but that we partake in the divine nature. We can escape from the corruption of this world... And that's one of the great blessings. He's given us access to true eternal life, life indeed. Starting in verse 4, For by these he's granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world by lust. Now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence, in your faith supply moral excellence, and in moral excellence, knowledge. And he goes on and gives us a list. But notice that faith. He wants you to have faith, and he wants you to build on that faith and to have a good, true, trustworthy, strong faith. And notice what he says. He doesn't expect you to have as much faith as Paul. He doesn't expect you to have as much faith as me or me to have as much faith as you. But what does he want? He wants a starting point. He wants that kernel of faith. He wants that mustard seed of faith. And after listing all of these good characteristics... He says in verse 8, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, he doesn't give a level. He doesn't say be at this percentage of faith. That's not how it works. If you have some faith, if you have a mustard seed of faith, and that faith is growing and increasing, and you're doing what it takes to grow it, then notice what it says. They render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, what you need to be useful in the kingdom is just a little bit of faith and a willingness to grow that faith. And that's what we need. And so if you're sitting there in the the pew um, during lessons and you feel like you're nothing, if you're at home and you feel like you're nothing, if you mess up as a, a, a husband or wife or as a father or mother or you mess up as a student you mess up as a Christian in general, you make a mistake. That doesn't disqualify you from the work. He doesn't say you have to have this certain level. He says if these are yours and increasing, if these are yours and are growing, then make that mistake, grow from it, learn from it, and come back and be stronger and strengthen other people. I think the church needs more people that talk that way that say things like, I'm not perfect. Here are my struggles. Here are my flaws. And here's how I've overcome them with the help of Christ. By the grace of God, I am what I am. People don't need to see some perfect image of a Christian, meaning sinless or without flaw. What they need to see is a Christian who's been perfected. And that means our faith is in the one who has the power to perfect us. That's what faith's all about, right? Faith is not in me, in myself. Faith is only as strong as what you have faith in. If I trust in myself, I'm going to disappoint myself. If I trust in the government, I'm going to be disappointed by the government. If I trust in money, I'll be disappointed in that. But if I trust in Jesus Christ, if I have faith in Jesus Christ, he will make me perfect. He will perfect me. That means I have flaws, but he's working on me if I trust in that. So if you're listening here, uh, where are you with this? How are you doing with this? Now, number one, if you feel like I've got no problems, I've got no worries, there's nothing wrong, there's no way I could ever fall or fail. Well, you've got a problem. You need to study God's word a little bit more and realize, yes, you could. Peter could, Paul could, the best of Christians could. 
But if you're at home and you're on the opposite end of the spectrum and you say, I feel worthless, I feel like nothing, everything I do is a mistake, I can't do it. I don't have enough faith to accomplish this or that. I'm nothing like that person or I'm not like I used to even be. I have less faith than I used to have. What I need from you is to say this prayer to God. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And then seek out the help of Christians. Seek out the help of God through prayer. Seek out the help of God through study and reading your word. Reading the word of God. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And then come back and you help strengthen other people. We're all going to have moments where we're weak. We will make mistakes. The important thing is that after we're done with the sifting of Satan, we come back and strengthen others. So I hope this has been practical for you. I'm stepping on my own toes here. I feel like uh, lately I've had a lot of areas that I just need to grow in. But I trust in the one who's able to make me righteous. And I trust in the one who's able to make me successful as I grow. Uh, If there's any way I can ever help you, please don't hesitate to contact me or anybody from our church. Um, Thanks and have a good day.